Good morning and happy blessed Sabbath, my brothers, sisters, and friends, wherever you may be tuning in from. I want to wish you a blessed and happy Sabbath. I believe that God has been with you throughout this week, that he's been keeping you and strengthening you and uplifting you throughout this week, that he's been giving you many victories by his grace. And if you haven't really been experiencing what you categorize as victories, know that God is still working with you and he's still working on you as well. So we could all say good morning and happy blessed Sabbath, wherever we are, where no matter our condition, no matter our situation, it by the grace of God is indeed a good morning and a happy, blessed Sabbath. I want to let you know right now, I want you to be very attentive to what I'm going to share with you right now. Listen very carefully. I'm going to share something with you that's extremely important, and I don't want you to miss this. I can't afford for you to miss it because when I got it, I couldn't afford to miss it. I need you to listen to very carefully to what I'm going to share right now, and this is it right here. What you need to know is that God is working on it. God is working on it. He's on top of things. God is on top of things. And so right now, all you need to do on this Sabbath day, all you need to do on this Sabbath day is rest in the truth, rest in the fact that God is working on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if God says that the Sabbath should be a delight, then he has to do things that would make the Sabbath delightful. He, If he calls for us to rest on the Sabbath, then he has to do things to make it possible for us to rest on the Sabbath. God won't give us more than we can bear. God would not make requirements of us that cannot actually be accomplished in our lives by faith in him and in his promises. So God is working on it so that you don't have to work on this Sabbath day. Uh, the Bible lets us know in the book of Exodus in chapter 20, there we find the 10 commandments and God says, remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all thy work. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter nor thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. And he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God's on top of things. God is doing the work so that you can experience Sabbath rest today. And so I don't know about you, but me, I have determined I've made up my mind to experience the fullness of the Sabbath today. You may have reasons as to why you can't rest. You may have reasons as to why you may feel unrest. But God's reason why you should not feel this way is because he is on top of him. things. What you need to do is what Jesus called the disciples to do at a certain point in time. He told them, come and rest a while. You've been working a lot. You've been working real hard. You've been stressing out quite a bit. You may have been a little bit fearful. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly who's watching this. But what I do know is that God has been watching over you. God has been carefully watching over you and over your life and everything that's going on therein, the complexities, the, the stuff, right? You don't even know how to term it at times. It's just, it's just stuff, situations and stuff, right? But God is on top of it. And that's the good news. That's the gospel for today, that God is on top of things. And what he wants you to do on this day is to be sure that you are consecrated to him. See, on our prayer line earlier today, we were talking about consecration and the importance of consecration. If you'd like to join our prayer line, it's a virtual prayer line that we come together and we pray. We uh, share the word of God, his promises from the Bible and from the spirit of prophecy. We meet together at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So do send us an email at lastrayministries at gmail.com. Again, that is lastrayministries at gmail.com. Send us an email and I will email you back with the link so that you can come along with us uh, in the morning where we just spend time in prayer and the consideration of God's words and God's promises to us as well. And we were talking about consecration this morning, the importance of being consecrated to God. We're not going to wait until next year to be consecrated to God. We're not, we're not, why should we wait uh, to do and delay something that we can do now to the future? We reckon that we need to be consecrated wholly and completely to God. We need to give up our whole selves to him. And so we were talking and praying to be fully consecrated to God. There may be some things in your life that have caused you to just naturally sway from God. We're built that way, not built by God that way, but we, our constitution, it's a sinful nature that we have that causes us to naturally be bent and prone 
to evil, prone to wander. But God, but God wants us to be consecrated to him. And he did a work in Christ so that you and I can be consecrated to him. He loved us. And because he loved us, it's his love that draws us nearer to him. We're going to sing that song, Draw Me Nearer, Nearer Blessed Lord. We're going to sing that song. But right before we do, we're going to have a word of prayer. But I want you to get this. And once you get it, you got it. And you will never be able to have it taken away from you. And that is when we look at the disciples. Remember, the disciples, they were following Christ. They were walking with Christ. They were following God because that's who Christ was. He was God in the flesh, walking in this world. And they were following Jesus. They were following God everywhere that he was going. But then when Christ died on the cross, they were all disappointed. They were all sad and shocked and amazed. And my thing is this, it's that they were walking with Jesus and Jesus told them multiple times, I am going to die. And when he did die, they were all sorely disappointed. How is your walk with God? Are you fully consecrated to God? How's your walk with him? Do you trust him? Last week in our prayer line, we were really thinking about the fact that, man, God is really trustworthy. He's really given himself for us wholly and completely. But but, 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 but we don't turn to him as often as we ought to. We don't turn to him as often as we ought to. How is your walk with God? The disciples walked with God. It was literally God on earth. They actually walked with their feet with God day by day. They were walking with him. They were going different places with God, yet they were surely disappointed when he actually did what he said he was going to do. When what he said was going to happen actually happened to him, friends. How is your walk with God? It has to be even better and even higher than the disciples, though it was literally with God here on earth. Our walk with God needs to get a lot stronger, friends. And by the grace of God, as we continue these studies in the book, The Great Controversy, and through the word of God, it is all for one purpose that our walk with God may get more and more solid and that we have a solid footing with him. So that when that time where many will be disappointed occurs, we, by the grace of God, we will stand firm for him because we know him as he is. So we are going to sing, draw me nearer, draw me nearer. That is number 300 and six. Welcome, welcome everyone. By the way, make sure you give this video a thumbs up. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe, right? Share this video near, far, and wide. Gather the families as well as we're going to be studying God's word. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up. It helps with the YouTube and the Facebook algorithm so that more and more people who are looking for the gospel, they will be brought to the word of God here. So we're going to begin with the word of prayer, as we have said, and we will sing and get into our study for the day. Chapter 21 in the book, The Great Controversy, A Warning rejected. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day and for this time where we could enter into the study of your word and we could fellowship with you and with one another as well. As we consider the thoughts that you have for us this morning, we ask for your Holy Spirit to enter into our minds in a very special way, that you may cleanse us from all of our sins, our unrighteousness, remove all the distractions, all the stuff, that may veer our minds or cause any kind of distraction to us from what you have for us this morning. God, we would not miss one thing. We want every single fragment that you have for us today. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' holy and precious name, we pray. Bless all those who are viewing as well and bless their families, that they may gather their families and their friends as well as we're going to study together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord. Let's see here. All right. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. 
Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. May my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my guide, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Amen. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. When we take a moment to think about the cross of Christ, what has been accomplished there for us, the redemption, the salvation, the victory, the peace. There was peace for us at the cross. The restoration, that ought to melt the heart and cause for us to realize that we are dealing with a God that loves us. He has given up all of heaven for your salvation. So don't you think for a moment that God has forgotten about you. Jesus cares about you. All that he has gone through was with you and no one else in mind. You see, no one else, as the song says, can touch my heart like Jesus does because no one else has done for me what Jesus has done. And even if someone were to die for me, the effect of their death does not do for me what the effect of the death of Jesus has done for me. There's something about the death of Jesus that is special specifically for you as an individual. His death is what saves your life. In the book of Romans in chapter five, we're told there that we are saved by his life and reconciled by his death. Before that, we were separated from God. We we're aliens uh, to God and from the commonwealth. But the death of, God, of Christ has reconciled us with God, has brought us back into unity with God. Not that the father was looking for a pound of flesh. Not that the father was saying, not somebody's going to got to die if I'm going to accept these little rascals. No, the father was in Christ when he saved you and when he saved me. The father was in Christ when he was reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ when he was doing that work of saving your and of saving my soul. God loves us so desperately. In fact, John put it in these words in the third chapter of his book there in the 16th verse. He said that God so loved the world. Not, not that just that God loved the world. That's good enough. But he said that God so loved the world. So this goes into the depth of God's love for this world, that he gave his only begotten son. The most precious thing that he has, he has given that to this world that didn't even care. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. He gave his son so that somebody would be blessed. Oh, this love of God is so rich and pure. It is measureless, friends, for you and for me. And we thank God for that love. And that love reveals to us the future so that we can make preparation for our lives, so that we can receive every every um, revelation, every prophecy, every uh, every warning 
for what's getting ready to come so that our hearts can be prepared to meet him in peace when he comes. So we're in chapter 21 in the book, The Great Controversy, a warning rejected. God is so loving that he would give us warnings as to what's going to come to pass so that we can avoid those things. I want you to understand that the things that are going to happen in the future, the destruction, the persecution, and all of those things, they are not God's prescription, but they're God's description of what's going to happen as the result of man rejecting him in these last days. I'm going to say that again because this is a very important point that all Christians need to understand and accept. It doesn't matter if you're Senate, Adventist, Catholic, Presbyterian, um, Baptist. I don't mind what religion, what denomination you are. That, that, that doesn't mean anything to me. What matters to me is that you know God as he is. What matters to me is that you know God as he is. And he will bring you where you need to go. What's going to happen in these last days, as God has revealed in his word, the destructions, the persecutions, and all these things, God wants you to understand that he did not prescribe these things. He wants you to understand, this is not my prescription, but rather this is my description of what's going to happen as a result of man rejecting me. I, I, don't, want the, I don't want people to be destroyed. I don't want destruction to happen to people. I don't want that, but that is going to be the result of their rejecting me. So now, those of you who are viewing us online, whether it is on YouTube or on Facebook, you will notice that in the description of the video, there is a study guide. You'll notice that it says study guide. And in fact, I will share with you on my screen even now, um, I, I, I will share with you so that I want to make sure that you see this and that you get this, Okay. And, uh, and you will see that there is a study guide here. So we're actually looking on YouTube right now. So there you guys are. And there I am here. And uh, well, uh, let me scroll here. Right. And you see where it says study guide right here. When you click on study guide, when you click on study guide here, it's going to bring you to this study guide here. It's going to bring you to this study guide. And all you have to do is go to chapter 21. Scroll and go to chapter 21. A warning rejected. A warning rejected. You click on a warning rejected and you're going to notice that there are questions so that as you're reading each chapter in the book, The Great Controversy, notice the questions. Notice the questions. And it's really neat because it also has the um, right here. It's a link and it has the page and the chapter where the answer can be found. So the first question is, what was Miller's attitude? towards the establishment of a new religious denomination? How did the proclamation of the Advent message affect the growth of the churches? And when you go right here in the study guide, if you're looking on the link, if you click on the link right here, 375.1, where my mouse is, 375.1, when you click on that, it's going to actually pull up Great Controversy, page 375, paragraph one, and there you have the answer. It's found in that paragraph. That's really neat, right? That's really neat. And so um, it has that for all the questions. Now, always click on the first one, not the second one. The second one is for a different version of the Great Controversy, I believe. And so I just stick to the first one, 375. That is the page of the original uh, 1911 version of the Great Controversy, the standard version. And so there the answer is found right there. What's also neat is that is there aren't only study guides for the book, The Great Controversy. There are actually study guides for other Sister White books. So actually the Apostle Study Guide. For each chapter, there's a study guide, and um, and it will give you the question and pages. So if you want to do a study of that book, you can do that as well with your brothers, sisters, and friends. The Adventist Home would be a really good one to do if you would like child guidance, Christian service, and the books go on. It's not all of the books, but it's several of the books. The Desire of Ages is a good one. Council on Stewardship, uh, Early Writings, etc. So these are great tools for you to use as you're studying yourself and as you're studying with others. We don't want to be casual readers because... Well, being casual leads to casualties. So we don't want to be casual in our readings, in our studies, but we want to be uh, really deeply thinking of what we're reading because what happens is that a lot of people read the spirit of prophecy um, and they end up being extremists. And we don't want to be those kind of Adventists or that kind of a Christian at all. We want to be middle of the road Christians that uh, really understand and rightly divide what we are studying. So now let's get right on into it, friends. We're going to get right on into it where we're going to be looking at chapter 21. And in chapter 21, it's entitled A Warning Rejected. And in this chapter in the book, The Great Controversy, it's going through the uh, the warning that was given to the world, 
uh, right before the great disappointment. It's also going through the character of the individuals during that time and the way that things were going on in that time period. It's very important that as we study the time and the people that were living in that time, we're going to see a lot of parallels between them back then and we today. So the first question, as we had just seen it in the study guide, the first question was, um, what was Miller's attitude toward the establishment of a new religion, religious denomination? How did the proclamation of the Advent message affect the growth of the church? So as you may have read this chapter with your families throughout this week, what did we see was Miller's attitude towards the establishment of a new religious denomination? Well, in that book, in the beginning, William Miller actually was not interested in there being a new denomination. He wasn't interested in there, in there being separate uh, meetings going on where he was preaching about the Advent uh, faith, about Christ returning and about the judgment uh, uh, coming, him and, and those that were working with him, and the church is preaching something else. He figured that what he was bringing should be joined together with the church. William Miller, he didn't want to start a new denomination or have separate meetings, but rather he wanted to incorporate the good news of Christ's soon coming with the already established organization. And this message in the beginning was actually causing for the church to grow. So let's notice that here in the book. It says there on page 375, paragraph one, that's where the answer is. In preaching the doctrine of the second advent, William Miller and his associates had labored with the sole purpose of arousing men to, pre to a preparation of the judgment. This They had sought to awaken professors of religion to the true hope of the church and to their need of a deeper Christian experience. And they labored also to awaken the unconverted to the duty of immediate repentance and conversion to God. So you see what his object was. His object was really for people, the unconverted people, to recognize their duty of repenting and being converted to God. I continue to read. They made no attempt to convert men to a sect or party in religion. Hence, they labored among all parties and sects without interfering with their organization or discipline. In all my labors, Miller said, uh, said Miller, I never had the desire or thought to establish any separate interest from that of the existing denominations or to benefit one at the expense of another. I thought to benefit all. I thought to benefit all, supposing that all Christians would rejoice in the prospect of Christ's coming. So his determination was really to encourage everyone to recognize that Jesus is coming soon. Prepare your heart and get your house in order. That was his work. That was what he was focused in on, not starting something new or separating or anything of that nature. That was not what he wanted to do. Now, the but now we know that there was a separation that eventually ensued. There was a separation that eventually occurred. Right. And we want to see, well, what changed conditions led to the separation of many Adventists from their former churches? What changes had occurred that caused for the Adventists? And that's what they were called. They were called Adventists, these people that were looking forward to the Advent that is the coming of Jesus Christ. They were Adventists. So what exactly uh, what changed conditions? Uh, led to the separation of many Adventists from their former churches. What were the conditions that caused for this change? Well, let's notice it here. As his work tended to build up the churches, it was for a time regarded with favor. They, they, they like that. But now we're going to notice the change in the condition. But, um, but as ministers and religious leaders decided against the Advent doctrine and desired to suppress all agitation, of the subject, they not only opposed it from the pulpit, but denied their members the privilege of attending preaching upon the second advent or even of speaking of their hope in the social meetings of the church. So the leadership, notice that, the leadership was telling the people, they were banning the people from studying this matter, from considering this matter, from talking about this matter. So they were legislating their speech, what they can talk about, and thus legislating what they can think about. They're saying, you can't even think about this thing. Don't talk about it. We don't, we're not presenting it here. You're banned from considering these things. 
especially in the social meetings. You can't talk about your hope concerning the advent of Christ. Thus, the believers found themselves in a position of great trial and perplexity. They loved their churches. Were the church leaders being unfair? Yes, but they loved their churches and were loath to separate from them. But as they saw the testimony of God's word suppress and their right to investigate the prophecies denied, they felt that loyalty to God forbade them to submit. Those who sought to shut out the testimony of God's word, they could not regard as constituting the church of Christ, the pillar and ground of truth. Hence, they felt themselves justified in separating from their former connection. In the summer of 1844, about 50,000 withdrew from the churches. About 50,000 withdrew from the churches. So, these individuals, friends, these individuals, did they love their church? Yes, they did. They loved their church. They loathed the idea of separating from their church. But they realized that if the church is forcing me to only consider certain things and shutting down any conversation, any consideration of this prophecy of the coming judgment, then I must obey God rather than man. We all come to a point in life where we have to make a decision, where we have to make a choice, where we can't dilly-dally anymore. And we have to make a choice either for God or against him, either for God or remain in the comfort of what we've always been in. But God has given us evidence upon evidence as to why we should trust him. We can trust him because he is trustworthy. The people recognized the truth and the validity, the validity really, the, valid, the validity of the truth of the coming judgment. They saw the prophecy. They heard it. They understood it. They were convinced of it by the grace of God. And they realized, I have a choice to make. If my church is shutting down any conversation about this, then I must separate. Because what they are in fact doing is they're coming in between my relationship with God. They're coming in between my relationship with God. My position, my position, me, this man that's speaking to you right now, my position is that if anyone is coming in between you and God, then there must be a separation, period, end of story, no way around it. And who will bring that separation? What will bring that separation? The great cleaver of truth, that is the gospel. The gospel will bring that separation. You see, there is no unity between light and darkness because the light will always cast out the darkness. So friends, understand that it may be a painful decision, an uncomfortable position, something that you may loathe to do. But if ever you're in a situation and the interesting thing is that this is the church, right? This is the church. So you would think, well, we should just abide by what the church says or just, you know, it's a church. And so I don't, I, I, I don't care who you are. I don't care what your title, what your position is. That does not matter. You are not Jesus. You are not Jesus. If there is something that is separating you from your savior, friends, if there's anything that is separating you from your savior, then you must be separated from that thing. You must be separated from that thing because in remaining connected with that thing and remaining one with that thing, you will of necessity be lost. So it was a great, it was a really great decision for these, um, for, 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 for these uh, 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 pioneers, for these individuals back then. It was a big decision for them to say, I'm going to separate from my church because the leadership is saying they de are denying the members of listening to the messages. The leadership is denying the members of expressing what they understand concerning these things. And so when that's the case, when that's the case, you let the great cleaver of truth do the separating. 
you let the great cleaver of truth be do the separating because sometimes we, we might be very hasty in separating and cutting people off and cutting things off maybe a little bit hasty in doing that sort of like peter when he pulled out his knife and cut off the ear of uh, the the of the roman soldier who was arresting christ that's not how we are to do things uh, we are to let the great cleaver of truth do the separating christ was eventually separated from the disciples anyway Christ was eventually separated from the disciples anyway. Why? Because the truth was that the disciples were not ready to face what Christ was going to face. Christ was ready. The disciples were not. So the truth separated the two of them. The truth separated Christ from the disciples, giving the revelation that Christ was ready, but the disciples were not. Do you see how the truth separates? I'm going to say that one more time because I want you to get this thing. Do you see how the truth separates? How did the truth separate Christ from the disciples? It revealed the character of the disciples and the character of Christ. The character that Christ had was a character that was ready to face death. The character that the disciples had was a character that was not ready to face death. So the truth, which was that, separated Christ from the disciples. Do we see that? I hope that's clear for you, friends. The truth separates. The truth will bring revelation of the condition of the hearts of men. And as that is revealed to you, that is their God revealing to you the direction which you must, must go. God is the one that will lead. He is the way, the truth, the life. All right. So let's keep on moving, friends. Let's keep on moving here. A uh, lot of wonderful lessons that we're going to continue to gather as we're continuing in this chapter. How would the spirituality of the church logically uh, be affected by the dismissal or withdrawal of such members as love that love Christ appearing? So now with those individuals being separated from the church, well, how how do we think that the spiritual condition of the church will be? OK, you see, the devil knows what he's doing. The devil wants to destroy the church. And the devil knows that if there be a separation, if there be a shaking, if there be a shaking, then those who remain and profess to be the church, they will misrepresent God. They will not be reflective of the ways of God. And, there's, and there you will find spiritual declension. There you will find spiritual declension. So how would the spirituality of the church logically be affected if those individuals who love the appearing of Christ uh, leave. Well, we're going to find the answer here as we continue to read in the great controversy here. Now, you notice that as I'm studying with you guys, I like to continue to go back to the book. I like to continue to go back to the book because I want to thoroughly encourage you. I want to thoroughly encourage you by the grace of God to read this book. I want you reading this book, and that's why we continue to read it together. So here we are, and we're going to see this thing. All right. So on page 376 here, 376 here, notice what it says. In fact, let's do it like this. 376 here, paragraph two, it says, oh, sorry, me. Hold on here. Uh, whoops. Let's see here. Boom. All right. There we go. All right. Now we're all set. Okay. About this time, a marked change was apparent in most of the churches throughout the United States. So there's a change that happened in the churches in the United States. There had been for many years a gradual but steady increasing conformity to worldly practices and customs. So there were already issues in the church, right? They were uh, abiding by the ways of the world and corresponding decline in a real spiritual life. But in that year, there were evidences of a sudden and marked declension in nearly all the churches in the land. While none seemed able to suggest the cause, the fact itself was widely noted and commented upon by both the press and the pulpit. So not only did those in the church realize that the church has really been going on a steady decline, but even those in the world have been recognizing that this the, the church has really been going on a steady decline and has been um, very worldly in their ways. And so the next few paragraphs goes through some um, journals and articles uh, where uh, authors, journalists were speaking about the condition of the church. I'll just read one. 
where it says, at, at a meeting of the Presbyterian Philadelphia, Mr. Barnes, author of a commentary uh, widely used and pastor of one of the leading churches in that city, stated that he had been in ministry for 20 years and never till the last communion had he administered the ordinance without receiving more or less into the church. But now there are no awakenings, no conversions, not much apparent growth in grace or profession or professors, and none come to his study to converse about the salvation of their souls. With the increase of business and the brightening prospects of commerce and manufacture, there is an increase of worldly mindedness. Thus it is with all the denominations. So it was recognized that even in the church, and it was recognized by the world as well, that those who would be attend attending the church, they were getting wrapped up in business and in commerce and in the things of this world. Now, we should understand that it's important to work if you work or have a career or have a business. It's important to do that. Jesus says, occupy till I come. And that's important to do that. We should work. It is our duty to work and God will provide us, provide for us. It's important to do that. We shouldn't be lazy. We shouldn't not be doing anything um, at all. That is not the way of Christ at all, right? But God doesn't want us to be wrapped up in the things of this world. We need to always remember that we are passing by. Now, those in that time as business, as the market, as things in the world were continuing to get better and better and better, manufacturing, etc., was going on, the people that would have went to church began to get sucked into the things of this world. And sadly, the gospel began to lose its power in their lives because they had sadly been rejecting God. They had been rejecting God. So since those who were spiritual had left the church, those that were in the church had nobody to look to. They had no models, no examples of individuals who continued to press on the upward way, no matter how things were going on in the world, whether good or bad. So because they didn't have that example, they didn't have that influence of the other church members, they began to decline spiritually. And as they were declining spiritually, they began to join hands with the ungodly in parties of pleasure, in dancing, in festivities, and in all of those worldly things. I actually have it underlined here on page 377, paragraph one, joining hands with the ungodly in parties of pleasure in dancing and festivities. Um, but we, I'll continue reading where it says, but we need not expand this painful subject. Suffice it that the evidence thickens and rolls heavily upon us to show that the churches generally are becoming sadly degenerate. They have gone very far from God and he has withdrawn himself from them. That's that's key right there. He has withdrawn himself. I made that yellow there. He has withdrawn himself from them. We've studied many times in the past as we were studying the uh, third angel's message, as we've studied uh, the death of Christ, as we studied the mechanism of how Jesus died. We studied why did Jesus have to die? How did Jesus have to die? And as we studied those two things, we saw the mechanism of how the Father dealt with all sinners in Christ. And here we read here that those individuals, they had gone far from God. They went afar off from God. And because they went far from God, what was the result? He has withdrawn himself from them. That's the language that is used, that he withdrew from them. We need to understand that if they went far from him, then really it's them that withdrew from God. But in also coupling it with the fact that God withdraws from them is to understand that God has accepted their choice to go away from them, to go away from him. And he went, he gave them their space, put it that way. God gave them their space. This is the same thing that he did with the children of Israel. Is the same thing that he did with the children of Israel when they rejected Christ. You remember, it was back there in 31 AD, and they had rejected Christ. They were seeking for ways to kill and to destroy Christ, the leadership of the church in that day. And they finally got a hold of him. They finally got a hold of him. They brought him before Pilate. 
they condemned and judged him and they said, let the condemnation fall on us and on our children. We want nothing to do with him. They rejected him. Christ died. The veil was rent in two, symbolizing that the sanctuary service is done. What did the people do? They sewed the veil up back together in the same way that Adam and Eve sewed fig leaf garments. They sewed the veil back together, which symbolizes their own righteousness by their own works to bring pleasure and to appease God. And so they did that work. And they continue to worship God in their own spirit and in their own truth, which was the spirit of the devil and which was not a truth, but was a lie. Friends, that's what they did. And Jesus had already prophesied to them when they need to leave Jerusalem because destruction was going to come. And when that destruction did come in 70 AD, what did they say? What did they say when the destruction came? They cried out. Ichabod, Ichabod. And what does Ichabod mean? It means the glory is no longer with us. God was no longer with them. Why? Because they left him and he gave them time to make up their mind. God gave them time to make up their mind. God has been giving you and your family time to just finally make up your mind. Make up your mind, God says. Choose this day who you will serve. God, get, they withdrew from God. They killed his son. Then God gave them more opportunity to accept him and receive him. Resurrected, preached them the gospel, the truth, so that they can accept him. But then what did they, they fully rejected him. And then God left them to themselves. And chapter one of the great controversy goes through the details. We went through that already. The destruction of Jerusalem. God allowed them to have what they wanted. And they reckon the presence of God is no longer with us. They said it out of their own mouth. And what happened when the presence of God was no longer with them? What happened when the presence of God was no longer with them? Confusion, Babylon, and destruction. You see, when God is not there, everything will be without form and void. And darkness will be there. But when God comes in, then there is light so that we can see the order of what God will create. But if you decide against God, you have already been created. If you decide against God, then what are you going to see? You're going to see destruction. You're going to see a reversion to your original state. And that is nothingness. And in order to get back to that original state without the presence of God, that means that there is going to be the destruction of those things. And that is what happened with Jerusalem. There was the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, God, so I, I, I share all of that so we can understand what are we expecting to see now that the people had rejected God and that God had withdrawn from them. What do we expect to see? Now that we understand that principle, we expect to see spiritual declension and eventual um, destruction. And, and, and it's going to be a slow degradation because there's still the profession of, of God. There's still the profession that they accept God. And so the destruction is going to be very, very slow. The degradation is going to be slow and painful. It's going to be slow and painful. And indeed, it was. Now let's read this here. Such a condition never exists without cause in the church itself. What is the condition? The condition is the spiritual declension and slow destruction of the church. And that condition never exists without cause in the church itself. There's a reason for it. Okay. The curse causeless does not come. There's a reason for it. The spiritual darkness which falls upon nations. The spiritual darkness which falls upon nations, upon churches, and individuals is due not to an arbitrary withdrawal of, this, of the suckers of divine grace on the part of God, but to a neglect or rejection of divine light on the part of men. 
So that's very, very clear. That's very, very clear right there. All right. Let me see here if I could pull up a dictionary. There we go. A dictionary. What does arbitrary mean? Okay. We've gone through this before, but I want you to see it right before your eyes. What does arbitrary mean? Arbitrary. It's an adjective. It's describing something based on a random choice or personal whim rather than any reason or system. It's whimsical. It's capricious. It's erratic, unpredictable, inconsistent. It's important. When we're reading this book, if there's a word in there that you don't understand, I mean, she was a she, she, it's third grade education and she's using, the, using these words arbitrary. Well, she wasn't in the third grade when she wrote this, uh, was inspired to write this. But nevertheless, um, third grade education, this woman was inspired. So arbitrary is used here. And so we want to know what does that mean so that we can understand what exactly this paragraph is saying. We're not casual readers because being casual leads to casualties. We want to understand what are we reading here? We're reading here that not to an arbitrary withdrawal of the suckers of divine grace on the part of God, but to a neglect or rejection of divine light on the part of men. That is why destruction comes. Destruction does not come because God is arbitrary. Destruction does not come because God is random and God has random um, um, ways of bringing destruction or execution to his people. No, everything that happens, all the destructions that have happened that we read of in the Bible, they're not just random things because God is like, um, okay, if you do this, I feel like destroying you this way. Because friends, if that were the case, that God says, I feel like destroying you this way because you did this. And that means that he is arbitrary, but that also means that he is not just wicked, but that he's extremely wicked. Because what it would require him to do if he says, I feel like destroying you this way, that means he has to have the desire to bring torture and destruction, uh, adequate torture and destruction before your full elimination. But the Bible makes it very, very clear in no uncertain terms in the book of 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 and in verse 16 that God is love. And the Bible also lets us know that love casts out all fear because in fear there is torment and love cannot be perfected in fear. God expects perfection of character in you and in me, Matthew chapter 4. Now, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, God says, um, uh, uh, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. So God is expecting perfection from us. But we can't experience that if he is threatening us with torture, adequate torture, until full elimination. We can't experience perfection of Christian character if it's under threat of torture and then execution. And so God doesn't function that way. God is not arbitrary, where he has different ideas of how he wants to destroy you. I mean, think about the flood. The Bible makes it very clear. God destroyed the earth by a flood, etc. But was God really sitting up there in heaven and saying, you know what? If you guys do this one thing, I'm just waiting for you guys to do this one thing. The moment you guys do that one thing, I'm going to make it rain. I'm going to make it rain, and it's not going to stop until everything is destroyed fully and thoroughly. And you know, okay, I'm going to save some of my friends, but all y'all, y'all are going to be gone. I'm going to save some of my friends because, because I don't have as many friends as the devil does in this world. And so that's not fair for me. So I'm going to adjust things so that I could have more friends in this world than him. Is that how God was seeking to do things? Of course not. Because think of it, friends. We're thinking here. If God was trying to do things in that way, then why didn't he just end the great controversy at the flood? Why wouldn't he just end the great controversy, end the great controversy at the flood? I have all my friends here. I destroyed all the devil's friends. I have all my friends here and they are all vindicating my character. So that's good. Um, uh, the great controversy has ended. Why not? Why was it the flood was not sufficient to end the great controversy? What does it say about God? That's the question. What does the flood say about God? If it just tells you, my God is so strong, so mighty, and so powerful. There's nothing uh, that my God can't do. That's not enough. God doesn't want you to respect and love him because of his power. God wants you to love him because he's lovable. God doesn't want you to trust him just because he tells you, you better trust me. You see what I did back there? So you could trust that if I say I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to do it. God doesn't want you to trust him because of that. God wants you to trust him because he's trustworthy. 
God wants you to recognize about him from the flood that he has done everything in his power to save the world. He's done everything in his power to save the world, everything in his power. But the world rejected him. The world wanted nothing to do with him. And he had to give up some of his, some of his responsibilities to this world. He had to give up some of his responsibilities to this world. And in them rejecting God, in the specific ways that they were rejecting God, the flood came. The flood came. The, the waters that were above the earth, it was great waters that was above the earth, giving our world a perfect climate. And there were also waters beneath the earth. What happens? Well, God had to let go. God had to let go of his responsibilities of holding up those things. And those things uh, broke, the, the waters of the heavens broke, and there was a deluge. And also the waters under the earth, there was a great deluge, much destruction. But eight, the Bible says, were saved by the waters. Eight were saved by the waters. And, and even so, most of them weren't even God's friends because they continued to have more and more children. And, and most of those children were not God's friends. But then at least eventually one of God's friends came as a result thereof, and his name was Abraham. So even with the flood, God has certain people, but, but their posterity, the majority of them, weren't even God's friends. And as a result of the flood, we know that many trees and all these great things end up going beneath the earth, became becomes coal and things like that, preparing the earth for the final cleansing by fire. Okay. So anyway... That's just to really uh, bring things together to make the point that God is not arbitrary in his ways. The darkness that occurred in the church was not an arbitrary act of God, but it was the choice of man to reject him. And we just gave another example of how things happened. We gave the example of the flood of how that destruction came as a result of man rejecting God. It wasn't an arbitrary random thing that God is like, I'm going to do this. But no, it was, a uh, it was the result of man's choice to try to get up close to God by going through the clouds. And God is saying, you can't do that. You can't do that. And if you think you're going to pierce through that, look what happens if you try to pierce through that. All these waters are going to fall on you. All these waters are going to fall on you. But you know, what? it doesn't have to be that way. Build an ark and get into the ark. Many made their choice either to go in or not go into the ark. And we saw the result of that. And let's continue to move forward. I, I want to be sure that you see the principles, the principles of what was going on with our friends back then in 1844 and, 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 and how God operates with his people. It is ever the same. The way that God operates with his people is ever the same. So now, now, now let's see here. Uh, what was the design of the first Angel's message. Before we even get to that, there, there, there's a very important reading here. I, I, I want us to get this here. It suits the policy of Satan that men should retain the forms of religion if but the spirit of vital godliness is lacking. Okay. So they're still looking at the condition of the church back then. Still looking at the condition of the church back then. This is a very important point. I didn't want to miss this. It suits the policy of Satan that men should retain the form of religion if but the spirit of vital godliness is lacking. The devil wants us to have a form of godliness denying the power thereof. That is the worst thing in the universe, to look like you're a Christian, but really you're not. Have you ever met people like that? Or are you like that? Is your family like that? Is your home like that? You go to church and everybody's holy. Everybody's holy. You guys pray when you're supposed to pray. You guys bow down in church. You know the order of things. You know the schedule. You do everything right. And you look the part. You look the part. But really in your heart, you are not that. Really and truly in your heart. You have the form of godliness, but you deny the gospel, which is the power thereof. You deny the gospel to turn sinners into saints. How is it with you and with your home? How is it with you and with your home? The devil loves that men should retain the form of, of, religious, of, of religion as long as the spirit of godliness is not there. 
She, after their rejection of the gospel, the Jews continued zealously to maintain their ancient rights. They rigorously preser preserved their national exclusiveness while they themselves could not but admit that the presence of God was no longer manifest among them. The prophecy of Daniel pointed so unmistakably to the time of the Messiah, of the Messiah's coming and so directly foretold his death that they discouraged its study. And finally, the rabbis pronounced a curse on all who should attempt to uh, attempt a computation of the time. So you see, not only did they not want anybody to study this thing, if they said, if you even try to look into this thing, you are cursed. You are cursed. Now, if I was one of those individuals back then and I was faithful to Christ by the grace of God, I, I would want to be faithful to Christ by the grace of God. I would say, I don't care about your curses. I can care less about your curses. And I most certainly do not want your blessing. Because you have rejected God. You have rejected his Christ. You have rejected the prophecy and his revelation. And so there's nothing from you that I want. I, your curses are false and no good. And no, I want you to understand that this must have been a challenge to, to the Jews back then. Because that's the leadership of the day. The leadership of the church in that day was telling them, if you study this, then you will be cursed. And the people in their minds needed to understand. Are those the leaders? Yes. Is this the church? Yes. But if they are saying that if you study this, then you will be cursed. The next question is, are they God? The answer is no. So your response needs to be, I don't care what you're saying. I don't care about your curses. I'd rather obey God rather than men. We all need to be brought to that place, friends, where we say, I'd rather obey God than men. It doesn't matter who that man is. It could be the president of the General Conference of Saturday Adventists. It could be the, 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 the Pope of Rome. It doesn't matter who the individual is. If anything is said against your conviction of the word of God, the clear word of God, then your response to be very, very simple is because it's not complicated. I like to say, I don't care because I don't. Doesn't matter. It means nothing. Good for you. But I'm going to move with God. And we don't need to be mad at one another. We don't need to be enemies. I'm just deciding that what you're, the value of what you're saying is nothing in compared to the value of the word of God. How do you value the word of God? How do you value the word of God? Jesus said, that if you aren't willing to give up all of yourself for the word of God, you're not worthy of the kingdom. How do you value the word of God? Do you value more the negativity of this world concerning the word of God than the positivity of the word of God itself? Do you value negativity more than positivity? That's the question. Do you value negativity? more than positivity in your life today. What do you value more? It comes down to your values. It really comes down to your values. What do you value more? Negativity or positivity? What motivates you more? Fear or faith? What is the driving force behind the things that you do? Negativity and fear or positivity and faith? That's the question that you have to answer for yourself. That's the question that your home needs to answer. That's the question that you need the answer to. So the individuals back then, many of them were moved by fear. Many of them were moved by negativity. And thus, they rejected God. Where the cause, Wherever the cause exists, the same results will follow. He who deliberately stifles his conviction of duty because it interferes with his inclinations will finally lose the power to distinguish between truth and error. If you constantly compromise for whatever reason, because of fear, because of wanting to please others, because of whatever reason, if you continue to compromise, then you won't be able to distinguish between truth and error and you will not be able to make up your mind for the right. So you who deliberately stifles your convictions, you're convicted of something, um, but 
you're moved by the negativity of others, by the lies of others, by the uh, by the by by the situation that you're in, sort of like these individuals back then in the time of Christ, and also in 1844, everybody is you know talking bad about the Adventist faith. Everybody's you know has a negative outlook on it. If 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 you stifle your convictions of that truth and your duty to live according to that truth, if you stifle that, then what that's doing as you're as you're doing that, you're not walking in your integrity. And that is going to interfere with your, uh, your your ability to choose the right. And you can't afford to have your ability to choose the right be made hazy because of others, because of situations, because of things. You can't afford that. Life will always throw things at us to make and make things difficult. But it is for us to realize who gave us this life and the strength that he will empower us in this life to be able to make it through in this life. The understanding becomes darkened. This is what happens when we're looking at spiritual declension. When we're looking at spiritual declension because of continuously considering negativity of others, the lies of others, the 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 the, the, the present the, the the bad light that others may put God in. What happens? The understanding becomes darkened. The conscience callous. The heart is hardened and the soul is separated from God. You see that? The soul becomes separated from God, where the message of divine truth is spurned or slighted. There the church will be enshrouded in darkness. Faith and love grow cold and estrangement and dissension enter. Church members center their interests and energies in worldly pursuits and sinners become hardened in their impenitence. You see, if we don't daily cultivate our personal relationships, if we don't daily cultivate our personal relationship with God, then what's going to happen? Spiritual declension, hardening of your heart, carelessness, laziness, casualness. All these things will occur if we do not work on cultivating daily and moment by moment our relationship with God, the study of his word, the study of the prophecies, and the moving according to the conviction that God puts in our heart. Because it's not just about study. It's not just about prayer. Because many will pray until they just fall asleep. Many will desire to be Christians, but they won't do it. They won't make that choice. But what we need to understand is the power of the will. This morning, we were reading one of my favorite chapters in the book, Steps of Christ, Consecration. We were reading that on our prayer line earlier today. If you'd like to join our prayer line, you can send me an email at lastrayministries at gmail.com. And we'll be sure to send you back an email response with the link so you can join with us virtually at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have a time of prayer where we pray. We encourage one another with, with the promises of God in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy as well. So if you'd like to join us at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, then send us an email at lastrayministries at gmail.com and we'll send you that link. And earlier today, we were focusing on the importance of being fully and completely consecrated to God. We want it to be consecrated to God. And we reckon there are many things that come in our lives that come in the way of us being fully dedicated and consecrated to God. And we have to eliminate those things. We have to allow God to eliminate those things so that we can be consecrated. There's a, a choice we have to make. And in the book, Steps of Christ, in the latter part in the book, Consecration, in the chapter Consecration, it explains that many will desire to be Christians, but they will be lost. Why? Because all they had was the desire. I want this. I want this so bad. You could want it so bad all you want. You could want it so bad all you want. That that. It, 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 but but what are you doing about it? Are you exercising the will that God has given to you? Are you exercising the will that God has given to you to choose him? God wants you to give up your will to him. He's going to refine and ennoble it, and he's going to give it back to you so that you can exercise it for him. How is your walk with God? How is the exercise of your will for God today? How is that going for you? God wants you moment by moment to exercise that will because it's only by exercise that you get stronger. It is only by exercise that you get stronger. So as you continue to exercise your faith for God, in spite of the challenges that life and that this world will bring to you, the negativity that this world will bring to you, as you exercise it, guess what? You will only become stronger. You will only become stronger by the grace of God. But sadly, that wasn't the case for the majority of the uh, of the of the professed Christians in that day. They became weaker because they were not exercising their will 
towards God. And what did that cause? We just read that that caused for there to be spiritual declension. They couldn't distinguish between the truth and error. Their understanding became darkened, right? And when the message of divine truth was brought to them, they spurned it, they slighted it, and the church was getting darker and darker and darker. Now, the darker it is, as we're moving along now, the darker it is, the more light you need. And God saw that the church was getting darker and darker and darker. So what do you think God was going to do for the church back then in the 1840s? As the church was declining spiritually, what do you think God was going to do for the church? What do you think God was going to do for the church back then? Well, God was going to do what he always does when there's darkness. In the book of Genesis and chapter one, in fact, let's just, let me just go there so you can see for yourself in Genesis and chapter one, I'm going to show you what God does. I'm going to show you what God does when there's darkness. What does God do when there's darkness? In Genesis chapter one, there in verse one, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be a light. So this is how God does things. When there's darkness, God says, let there be light. God brings light where there is darkness. So what can we expect? What can we expect since the church has been spiritually declining? The church was in darkness back there. What do we think God is going to do? God is going to say, let there be light. God is going to say, let there be light. Now, how did God say, let there be light? How did God say, let there be light? Let's go back to, let's go back and see. How did God say, let there be light? Well, he brought to them the first angel's message. The first angel's message. The word of God is the light. The gospel is the light. The beautiful light that shines in the face of Jesus Christ. First Corinthians chapter four. The first angel's message of Revelation chapter 14, announcing the hour of God's judgment and calling upon men to fear and worship him was designed to separate the professed people of God from the corrupting influence of the world and to arouse them to see their true condition of worldliness and backsliding in this and backsliding. So let's consider the thought there. You see, I'm telling you, Sister White was inspired because first we're talking about darkness. Genesis chapter one, we see darkness. And now we're talking about light that comes through the gospel brought by the first angel. God, after he saw the darkness, he brought light. Why? So that we can see the work that he's going to do. God, the first thing that God did, he said, let there be light. Why? He said, let there be light so that we can see the mess and so that we can see how he will bring order in a place where there is disorder and chaos. And there in the beginning, God brought the cosmos out of chaos. Okay. So here we're going to see that the church, well, we just saw that the church was in a chaotic situation and we're going to see how God is going to bring uh, a, a, a beauty to this chaotic situation. Uh, the cosmos or cosmos um, the cosmos, that's where we also get our word cosmetics from. And what are what are cosmetics used for? Cosmetics are used to beautify things, beautify people, right? Um, uh, uh, brushes are cosmetics. So earlier today, I was using a cosmetic. I was using a brush. I do need to get a haircut. <clears throat> Don't look too close. And uh, but 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 I was using co a cosmetic because I know that I'm going to present myself before you. When I woke up, I looked a mess, but I said, I'm going to be before God's people and I can't come before them as a mess. So what do I have to do? Well, I have to make sure that I use some of the cosmetics that I have available, shea butter, all right, uh, and, 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 and a brush, amen, and some, uh, 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 some Vaseline or whatever, uh, uh, chapstick and stuff like that, so that when I'm before you guys, um, what was at first chaotic and darkness and, and, and messed up can now be brought in order. And we see God does the same exact thing with the church. They were in a, a chaotic situation and now he brings the first angel's message to, uh, so that the church can see its condition and so that the gospel of that first angel's message could bring to them restoration, can bring to them restoration. Let's keep on reading. Announcing the hour of God's judgment and calling upon men to fear and worship him. Fear not being afraid, but fear acknowledge, be in awe of God and his beauty. Fear and worship him. 
was designed to separate the professed people of God from the corrupting influence of the world. Ah, so 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 what does it do? It was designed to separate. So what's doing the separating? What's doing the separating? The gospel, the truth of the first angel's message does the separating. The truth does the separating, as we were talking about a little bit earlier. The truth does the separating. Now let me jump down here to the underlying section. In this message, God has sent to the church a warning. In this message, God has sent to the church a warning, which had it been accepted, would have corrected the evils that were shutting them away from him. If they had accepted the warnings, it would have corrected the evils that were shutting them away from God. Had they received the message from heaven, humbling their hearts before the Lord and seeking in sincerity a preparation to stand in his presence, the spirit and power of God would have been manifested among them. The church would have again, would again have reached that blessed state of unity and love which existed in apostolic days when the believers were of one heart and of one soul and spake the word of God with boldness when the Lord had added to the church daily, such as should be saved. If they had accepted that message in that time, then they would have been united. They would have been united as they ought to have, as God had desired for them to be. Now we're winding down. We're closing down here. We're closing down here. We're closing down here. But there's still just a few more things that I want to consider with us. And then we close down. What were the reasons that led to the general prejudice and unbelief? In the Advent message, there were certain things that caused for them not to believe in the first angel's message. And we want to consider, we want to consider what was it that caused for for there to be a general prejudice against the first angel's message. And we're going to see what exactly that rejection involved. What exactly that involved. Now, what we need to know, and I'll tell you the answer right here, and then we're going to we're going to come back to the reading, is that what cause for there to be prejudice prejudice against the message was that those who were given them giving the message they were laymen they were laymen and so the pastors in that time the leaders in that time as they said to Christ who are you you know preaching and you're not learned you don't know the letters right they said they're they're not doctors they're not pastors so so they shouldn't be considered what they're sharing should not be considered. So the pastor told the people to ignore them, to ignore them. And many of the people uh, listened and ignored those who were preaching the second coming of Jesus, the convicting message of the time of judgment. They, many people rejected or ignored them or had prejudice against them. Why? Because the leadership of the church in that day was telling them that they should. The leadership in the church was telling them that they should. And the people obeyed the leadership out of fear of being kicked out of the synagogue. Just like the Jews back then who had rejected Christ. Out of fear of being kicked out of the synagogue, they rejected the most important warning that was coming to them in that day. I'm telling you that fear is the worst thing in the universe. It's, it has to be one of the worst things in the universe. Fear. Let not. You know what you should do? You should make your fears cower in the corner and be afraid of you. You should make your doubts be doubtful of their ability to make you doubt yourself and not do the work that God has to wants to do in you and that you have to do for God in these last days. Make your fear be afraid. Make your doubts doubt themselves. Make all those things that make you weak recognize their weakness and the power that is in God that works in you to do his work through you and for God and for others as well. We have to reverse things in our life. We have to learn to reverse things in our life. And you know what? We can by the grace of God because God has given us the power to choose for it to be so. We have the power of choice and it is that simple for us to choose how things ought to be. God gives us the ability to choose how things can be. Now, we can't choose our situation and our circumstance. We can't choose the seasons. Right now, we're in the fall, and that's what it is, and that's what we're going to deal with, the fall. And after the fall is going to come the winter. So we have to learn to deal with the things that we cannot change. We deal with that, and it is what it is. Oh, well, too bad. That's what it is. We learn to deal with that, but that ought not change the work that we have to do the person that we are, and and, and the person that we want to be. It cannot change just because of the change in the seasons. Let the seasons do what they do. You manage yourself through those seasons and don't be changed. Maybe you might, of course, you're going to have to wear a coat in the winter because you got to wear a coat in the winter. 
But you as an individual, you don't change because you're wearing a coat. You don't change because you're wearing a coat. I hope that you get this, friends. So don't change because of the seasons and because of the situation of life and certainly not because of fear. But let your fears be afraid. Let your doubts doubt. But you have faith. You have trust and you have confidence in God and never be managed or maintained or moved out and about by those things. So let's come back over here. Uh, the people, they, uh, because of fear, they rejected the message. Now let's notice um, what, we're, what we read in the great controversy. If professed people, if God's professed people would receive the light as it shines upon them from his word, they would reach that unity for which Christ prayed for, the unity of the spirit. Now jump down here. This paragraph is where we have our answer as to the reasons as to why there was a prejudice and what did their rejection involve. Such were the blessed results experienced by those who accepted the Adventist message. They were united. They came from different denominations and their denominational barriers were hurled to the ground. Con conflicting creeds were shivered to atoms. The unscriptural hope of a temporal millennium was abandoned. False views of the second advent were corrected. Pride and conformity to the world were swept away. Wrongs were made right. Hearts were united in the sweetest fellowship and love and joy reigned supreme. If this doctrine did this for the few who did receive it, it would have done the same for all. It would have done the same for all if they had received it. That is what that gospel was did for the few and would have done for all if they had all received and accepted the beautiful message. People from even different denominations would have finally come together to that truth, standing on that truth, meaning rejecting the, tr the, the, the falsities of their denominations, but accepting the truth of this gospel. They would have come together and united upon the truth and their false views would all have been corrected. Pride and conformity to the world would have been swept away. Wrong would have been made right. Are there any wrongs that you have with others that need to be made right? Things would have been fixed and restored as God would have had it and there would have been that unity for them to do the work that God wanted for them to do. But the churches generally did not accept the warning. Sadly, the churches as a whole did not accept the warning. Now, the underlying piece here is what we were talking about a moment ago. The fact that the message was to a great extent preached by laymen was urged as an argument against it. The fact that the message was brought by laymen was urged as an argument against it. As of old, the plain testimony of God's word was met with inquiry. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed? And finding how difficult a task it was to refute the arguments drawn from the prophetic period, many discouraged the study of the prophecies, teaching that the prophetic books were sealed and were not to be understood. Many were giving excuses. They were giving up too early. They were saying, look, we can't understand the prophecies and we're leaders, we're doctors of the law. We're, 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 we're in this book and we can't understand it. And if we can't understand it, then nobody else can. That's what they were saying. Now, my thing is this, if you can't understand it, it doesn't mean that I can't. If you can't understand it, that doesn't mean that God wouldn't be so generous and so kind to reveal it to somebody else. No one has a monopoly on the truth and on the revelation of God. No one has a monopoly on it. And so if anyone thinks that they do, they ought to know that they are enemies of the gospel. They're enemies of the work because they have made themselves, well, they have taken the position of Christ and they are antichrist. They have taken the position of Christ by saying that I am the way. If you want to understand things about the Bible, then, well, you got to understand it through me. I am the way. And through me, you're going to get the truth. And if you're getting this truth, then your life will be prolonged. Th that's the profession that one makes if they say, because I can't understand this in the word of God, nobody else can. And, and if nobody else can, we should just ignore this piece. No, everything in the word of God should be investigated and should be sought for us to be able to understand. Because God has given it to us to understand it. And God will reveal it to us as well. So the argument back then was that nobody can understand the prophecies. And so we shouldn't uh, study it. We shouldn't consider it. We should ignore it all as a whole. But God had faithful people who decided, no, we're not going to ignore it all. We're going to consider it. We're going to study it for ourselves because we want to know what exactly this first angel is bringing so that we can experience what God has for us in these last days. Don't let anyone stop you from experiencing what God has for you in your life. Don't let anyone stop you from experiencing what God has for you in your life. You have to make the choice to say, no, God has given me this revelation. God has given me the first angel's message. God has given me this gospel. And if you don't understand it, you don't understand it. 
but God has shared it with me. God has revealed it to me and I must move according to my conviction and I will not be stopped by you because the walk that I am having is the walk of faith to Christ, is the walk of faith to Christ. And that is the walk that our friends had back there in 1844. Now, I'm not going to come back to this book because we, uh, because I want to close down here, but there were, there were a few more last things that I will share with us even now. There are a few more last things that were going on in this chapter. All those, all those, my friends, all those who had rejected the message of the second coming of Jesus and of preparing their homes and of judgment, all those who had rejected that message for whatever reason, if it's out of fear, you're still in the same bucket, you reject it. If it's because you didn't like the people, you're still in the same bucket. It doesn't matter whatever your reason for what you were too shy, you were too weak. It really doesn't matter. You end up in this bucket of the people that are lost, the people who are in the synagogue of Satan. If you remember our studies on the churches, the synagogue of Satan, right? In, in the study of the churches, this is a part of that, right? So those who had rejected the message for whatever reason, they ended up in the synagogue of Satan, Babylon, and the daughters of Babylon. Babylon in the Bible is symbolized by a woman. Babylon in the Bible is symbolized by a woman. You could write down the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2. And you want to couple Jeremiah 6 and verse 2 with Isaiah 51 and verse 16. And those are the two biblical texts that let us know that a woman represents a church in Bible prophecy. That's Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2 and Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 16. That lets us know in the Bible that a woman represents a church. And the woman, in the book of Revelation, we find two women. We find the harlot and we find the pure woman. The harlot woman, that represents the false church. And the Bible says that she has many daughters in Revelation in chapter 17. And the harlot, the false church, also has other churches that have split from her, but still abide by her doctrine and by lots of her um, beliefs, particularly Sunday worship. You see, that came into fruition from the Roman Catholic Church, where they had established, it really actually came from way back in the time of Nimrod. Uh, so sun worship, that was way, 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 way back in the beginning. You could read of Nimrod in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, and you could read more about the sun worship throughout the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel in particular, chapter 8 and chapter 9, etc., Sun worship was a very big thing, and, 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 and the Roman Catholic Church has taken full hold of that and has claimed and has professed that our mark of authority is the establishment of Sunday sacredness. And every church that, 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 that does this, that, that worships on Sunday, it is because they are pledging allegiance to us. That's what she said. That is what the Roman Catholic Church has said. Okay, so that is her faith. That is her belief. And everyone who does that is the same thing. And she has been identified very, very clearly as we've read in the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. And if you are in our class on Sunday evenings at 7 p.m., then you know that we've gone through this in detail. The mark of the beast, the image of the beast, the first and second beast of Revelation in chapter 13. We've seen very, very clearly who the beast represents and what its mark is, etc. We came to understand that this false church, right, this false church, everyone who rejects the truth ends up bucketed under the false church or her daughters, under the false church and her daughters. And those individuals, many of them that are there are confused, are confused. They don't know the background. They don't know all the details of the church. They don't know all the issues in the church either. They do not know. They do not know. And sadly, they do not know the truth. But God has the third angel's message that would bring a light to them so that they can come out of Babylon because the second angel's message says, Come out of Babylon. Come out of Babylon, my people. Leave Babylon. Leave Babylon. And so in that time, there was also the call. There was also the call to leave Babylon. Don't drink of the wine of Babylon. And if you listen to our podcast, Last Year Ministries podcast, which is on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, um, uh, uh, Google Podcasts, Spotify, you can just type in Last Year Ministries and you'll see our podcast. We've been going through the book of Proverbs and we saw in the book of Proverbs, we were looking at Proverbs chapter 23. And in the end of Proverbs chapter 23, there's a whole section where it talks about how wine is not good for the people of God. And the Bible talks about 
the wine and the wine of Babylon. Those who are drunk and intoxicated with the wine of Babylon, the wine of Babylon being the doctrine, the teachings of Babylon. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 7, um, there we understand that wine is false teachings. Wine is false teaching. That's Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 7. It shows us that wine is false teachings. And so God makes it very, very clear. God makes it very, very clear that the wine is false teaching and those that drink of the wine of Babylon, the false teaching of Babylon, such as infant baptism, such as Sunday sacredness, such as the veneration of saints, such as the um, the, 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 the sinlessness of Mary, uh, such as uh, indulgences you could pay in order for your sins to uh, be, 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 be paid for, basically, because the sacrifice of Christ, uh, the currency of the sacrifice of Christ was not sufficient to pay for your sins, um, is the thought. If you're paying for your sins or for the sins of others who are in the false place uh, purgatory, which is not even a real place. Um, all these false doctrines, those who believe in those false doctrines, or any one of them, um, uh, uh, they are in Babylon and God wants them to come out. So the third angel's message is a call for them to realize their condition. It is a gospel to show them that God can restore them from sinners to saints and also a call. Look, because I because I can do this and you know I can do this. Come out from where you are into God's marvelous light, into God's marvelous light. God is going to have a people, my friends. God is going to have a people in this chapter. I love the way that it ends. It ends by let, with good news. It ends with the good news that God is going to have a people that are going to come out of Babylon. The majority of God's people are actually in Babylon right now. God is going to have a people. We're going to have a, there's going to be a mass exodus out of Babylon because the light and life and gospel of Christ will be in your life, will be in your home. And your life and your home will be a beacon of light to your community and to this world. And people will behold and will be changed and will be brought closer to Christ. And they will leave where they were to get closer to Christ so that when he comes, they can see him as he is. There's going to be a repetition to come out of Babylon. And we read of that in Revelation in chapter 18. And verse one, where John says, I saw an a another angel come down from heaven, having great power, which is the gospel, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. The earth was lightened with his glory. And there it says, Revelation 18 points to the time when, as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation chapter 14, verse six through verse 12, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel um, uh, uh, and the people of God still in Babylon, will be called upon to separate from her communion. So the first church will be fully drunk, will be fully uh, 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 fully drawn, uh, uh, cut off from God. But those who are in there, they will separate. Those who are in there who choose God, they will separate. This message is the last, is the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to this dying world. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world, and it will accomplish its work. It will accomplish its work. This is the last message, Revelation chapter 18, the last call for people to come out of darkness into God's marvelous light. How is that message going to be given? We had just said that message is going to be given as the light of the life of Christ is revealed in you. The last rays of merciful light. The last message of mercy to be given to this world is the revelation of his character of love. And as the revelation of God's character of love is revealed to those in this world and those in Babylon, then that light will cast away all darkness. That light will cast out the darkness. And as that darkness is cast out, even as it was in the beginning, God in, professing, in saying, let there be light in their life, there will be light in their life. And he will create in them a new heart so that they can be a part of his final church. So that when he comes, they will see him as he is because they, by the grace of God, have been made as he is. It's my prayer that each and every single one of us will be just like Jesus. That each and every single one of us will reject all of the ways of Babylon, the false ideas of Babylon concerning God, concerning the ways of God, the life of God, the way that God does things, and that we will receive the truth as it has been revealed in the life, the death, 
and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension of Christ, the work of Christ in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, that we receive that same Jesus so that when that same Jesus comes down, we would recognize him and we would go up to be one with him and reign with him forever. That is my prayer for us all. Let us close here by the grace of God with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all that you've taught us today. Thank you for having us uh, go through the history of the Advent movement. Thank you for showing us that that they didn't want to separate from the church. They wanted to remain united with organization with the people, but there needed to be a separation because which was done by the truth because others were rejecting the truth that you have revealed of the time of judgment and the great need for them to get their homes in order. God, we want our homes to be brought in order. So help us to not be like the leadership of the past who are, who, who were uh, denying people the right to study the truth, denying people the right to express what they understand of the truth. Help us to be free. Help us to be free Christians to seek you and search you, knowing that if we search you with all of our hearts, we, you will be found, O oh God. Lord, if there's any darkness in our heart, we ask that you may pr pronounce the words, let there be light. And we ask that the light of the glory of the life of Christ may be revealed to us and may lighten our life so that we can be a light to this world. And as we are a light to this world, we will call others out of Babylon, out of darkness into your marvelous light, God. We realize that we can't call people out of something that we are in. And so we help, we ask you, God, that you may uh, bring us out of a condition of fear. Bring us out of a condition of anger. Bring us out of a condition of, of bitterness. Bring us out of a condition of, of depression. Bring us out of, of, of whatever condition is not the result of righteousness, is not one of the fruit of your spirit. Bring us out of those conditions, oh God, and bring us into the condition that is the that whose result is the fruit of your spirit, oh God. So that when others partake of the fruit of your, of your spirit in our life, that they may taste and see that you are good, that quite possibly they might end up taking in one of the seeds of that spirit and that that seed may grow in them so that they themselves can also bear fruit by thy grace, oh God. This is our prayer. This is our desire. This is our hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to wish you all, brothers, sisters, and friends, a happy, blessed Sabbath. Next week, we're going to be looking at chapter 22. And it's going to be very special next week. So you want to make sure that you tune in. It's going to be a special Sabbath. And I'm really looking forward to it by the grace of God. So it's my prayer that you were really blessed today. If you'd like to join us um, on our prayer line, again, our virtual prayer line, send us an email at lastwayministries at gmail.com. We'll send you the link so that you can join with us. And please be sure to like, share, and subscribe to this channel and this video as well so that the YouTube and the Facebook Facebook algorithm can share this video further and further by the grace of God. Have a happy... Oh, by the way, also, if you'd like to support, you can always support uh, via Zelle Pay. Our email is Ministries. You can send it there at gmail.com for Zelle Pay or use the PayPal link or the Cash App. You can always do that there as the Lord so moves you to do so that we can continue to further this work as we have more things, more plans, big plans for next year by the grace of God. So keep us in prayer as we continue to do the work by His grace. And we look forward to seeing you next week by the grace of God. So God bless and have a happy, blessed Sabbath.